Hello, everyone. Welcome to Principles of Macroeconomics. In this video, we'll be covering Chapter 1, Economics, Foundations, and Models. So in this chapter, we'll be kind of talking about what this class is all about initially, and then diving into three key economic ideas, the economic problem that every society must solve, and one that we'll see throughout the semester, as well as introducing the concept of economic models. We won't introduce your first model till chapter two, but we'll lay a brief foundation. And finally, a little bit of the differences between macro and microeconomics as well as economic skills and as a career and a preview of a couple important terms we will also be discussing later this semester. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in. So what is this class about? So economics is the study of choices people make to attain their goals given scarce resources. So it's essentially the study of decision making given scarcity. Scarcity here, we've defined it as a situation in which unlimited wants exceed limited resources available to fulfill those wants. Scarcity is the economic problem that all societies face and must solve. Okay, so in order to study choices given scarcity, economists use what are called economic models. Again, like I mentioned, we'll be introducing our first model in chapter two, but what models are essentially are simplified versions of reality used to analyze real world situations. So we will, I want you to think about economic models. They are like a map. So a map, it shows you where you are and where you need to go. Okay, so this semester, hopefully, we'll learn how to answer some typical economic questions, questions such as how are the prices of certain goods and services determined, why does international trade occur, and why does the government control prices of some goods and services, and what are the effects of these government controls. So let's move on and talk about the three key economic ideas. Economic agents, they interact with each other in what are called markets. A market is a group of buyers and sellers and the institution or arrangement by which they come together to trade. So the market itself is the group of buyers and sellers and this institution and arrangement in which they come together. There are a lot of different examples of markets. If this was an in-person class, I would say, what are some examples of markets you can think of? Some that I could think of off the top of my head would be like eBay, you know, Facebook Marketplace. The pod on campus. stock market, right, etc. So when analyzing markets, we're generally going to make three separate assumptions. One, people are rational. Two, people respond to economic incentives. And three, optimal decisions are made at the margin. And we'll talk about each one in turn. A little bit. The idea that people are rational, the assumption that people are rational, 
this means that people generally use all available information to achieve their goals. So rationality, it doesn't mean that people always make the best decision or the right decision. Merely means that you're using all available information to achieve their goals. So think about when you price check an item on Amazon or using a price checking tool or app. You're trying to use all available information to make the best decision, right? You're trying to see, oh, can I get this item cheaper on Amazon? Can I get it cheaper online? Is there a better price to be found out there? Number two, people respond to economic incentives. Incentives change, and so do the actions people take. So... An example I think about is, when I think about responding to economic incentives is the idea that a family or a person may decide to give up cable and switch to streaming services, right? Because at a lower cost, they have access to more options than they would using satellite or cable, so we may opt to buy several different streaming services instead of paying for cable channels, right? So because of the lower price point, people may switch to a different product, a substitute product. In this case, people have switched to streaming services rather than using cable. Also, people have switch from going to the movies to staying in and streaming a movie. We've seen this very predominantly during the pandemic as movie theaters have had to close and you've seen releases of movies directly to the consumer through streaming services. One example I watched over the Christmas break was Wonder Woman 84 that was released in theaters and directly on HBO Max to consumers on the same day. Finally, optimal decisions are made at the margin. So usually decisions aren't always all or nothing. A lot of decisions involve a little bit more of one thing or a little bit less of another thing, right? My example for this is... 2 a.m. Should you watch another episode or go to bed? So, economists think about decisions like this in terms of marginal cost and marginal benefit. Marginal cost, marginal benefit, when you compare those two, it's known as marginal analysis. Essentially, what marginal cost and marginal benefit is, is the additional cost or benefit associated with a small amount or extra of some action. So we can think about the margin as that 
little bit of additional extra, that marginal cost or marginal benefit is the additional cost or additional benefit. Okay, let's move on to the next section. So what's the economic problem that every society must solve? Your answer is scarcity, right? We have limited resources to satisfy our desires. Because of this, we face trade-offs. What's a trade-off? It's the idea that because of scarcity, producing more of one good or service means producing less of another good or service, right? So in order to gain more hours of sleep, what do we have to do? We have to watch less Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus or insert your favorite streaming service there, right? There's a trade-off. So we have three questions we can answer or think about at least. What goods and services will be produced? Will be produced? How will the goods and services be produced? And who will receive the goods and services produced? So what goods and services will be produced? Obviously, this must be decided by not only businesses, but individuals, right? In order to increase production of one good, it requires the reduction of production of another good, right? So think about working and going to school. If you're going to school on campus and it requires you to be there full time as a student, you may not be able to work a 40 hour a week job right so we have to decide should we produce education human capital or should you produce salaries right so there has there's a decision that has to be made there businesses obviously have to decide what type of product is going to be more profitable which one will appeal to consumers more how will the goods and services be produced? Uh, think about the different methods for producing certain goods and services, right? Um, from a university perspective, should a class be provided online like this one? Or should it be provided on campus, right? Um, think about how different methods may affect the quality of a good or service. Finally, who will receive goods and services produced, right? When we think about this question, we can think about, obviously, there's going to be differences when it comes to income, welfare policies. Think about how socially disadvantaged communities are going to be affected related to the distribution of welfare, etc. Okay, so now let's talk about the different types of economy. We have three different types of the economies. We have a centrally planned economy, we have a market economy, and we have a mixed economy. Centrally planned economy, that is an economy in which the government decides how economic resources are allocated. Market economy, the allocation of resources is dependent on decisions of households and firms interacting in markets. So think about the market and the interactions of buyers and sellers. Finally, we have a mixed economy in which, although most decisions may result from the interaction of buyers and sellers in markets, some decisions are also made by the government, and the government does play a significant role in the allocation of these resources. So the mixed economy has elements of both the centrally planned and market economy, and the U.S. has what we call a mixed economy. Okay. So if we think about a centrally planned economy, um, you can use North Korea as an example of that. Market economies, it's very hard to find an example of a purely market economy today in the world because the government 
of many of these countries still does have a little bit of a role in making economic decisions about resource allocation. So market economies tend to be a little bit more efficient than command economies. They are going to promote both productive and allocative efficiency. Productive efficiency, think about production, is production at the lowest possible cost, while allocative efficiency is in accordance to consumer preferences. So both of these are promoted by market economies, but productive efficiency, this comes about because of competition. While allocative efficiency is due to voluntary exchange. What is voluntary exchange? Voluntary exchange is a situation that occurs in markets when both the buyer and the seller are made better off by the transaction. This means that each transaction that takes place improves the overall well-being of both the buyer and the seller. And these transactions will continue to take place up until no further improvement can occur. Okay. Keep in mind, market economies don't always result in fully efficient outcomes. So people are not always the most efficient and governments do interfere sometimes with market outcomes. Market outcomes also sometimes ignore those who are outside of the transaction and the impact they have on those outside of those involved in the transaction itself. Also, economically efficient outcomes aren't necessarily desirable, right? Because efficiency doesn't always mean fairness. It doesn't always mean that an outcome is fair or equitable. Remember, equity is the fair distribution of economic benefits, and there's going to be a trade-off between efficiency and equity. Okay, so let's move on to economic models. I'm not going to ask you to be able to list out all the steps as far as building an economic model. And we're not going to be going too much into the formulation of a hypothesis, scientific method. We won't be talking about that too much. Keep in mind, economics itself is a social science. That means we're studying human behavior. And humans don't always act rationally. They're not always completely... simplistic in the decisions they make. So economics doesn't exactly fit the natural science scientific method model all the time. Economists use positive and normative analysis to study behavior. And they do that by using both positive analysis, which is concerned with what is, and normative analysis, which is concerned with what ought to be or what should be. So here we have some examples of statements that I've asked you to determine if they are positive or normative. I've given you the answers on the side here. You can read the first couple. An increase in unemployment insurance will increase the length of time that laid-off workers remain unemployed. That is a positive statement. 
And we have our second statement, which is that government should provide free child care to increase gender equity in the labor market. The second statement is a normative statement. You can see clearly it has the word should in it, which is an indicator that it's a normative statement. However, not all normative statements have the word should or ought to be in them. Norm other normative statements may include something uh, like, oh, the price of the new Apple headphones are so expensive or way too expensive, something like that. And that would be a normative statement. It's not concerned with what is. It's not necessarily based in fact. It is more of an opinion and an extreme opinion in that sense. Okay, so let's briefly talk about the difference between micro versus macroeconomics. In this class, we'll be studying macroeconomics, which means we'll be focusing on the big picture. Macroeconomics talks about the economy as a whole. It includes topics such as inflation, unemployment, and economic growth. Keep that in mind when you are writing your current event assignment. We'll be looking at topics related to current events. And you'll be writing on how these current events relate to your macroeconomic topic of choice. Microeconomics, on the other hand, is more concerned with the details of how individuals and businesses make choices, how they make decisions, how they set prices, how they interact in markets, etc., rather than the economy as a whole. Both of them are related, obviously, but one focuses on more of the nitty-gritty detail and the other focuses on the economy as a whole, the big picture. So kind of that translates into our next little section here when we talk about economic skills and, and economics as a career. Like I said before, since economics is the study of choices, given scarce resources, you can also think about economics as the study of decision making. Scarcity is faced by everyone. All people, all businesses face it and have to make decisions and trade-offs to adjust for it. So, with that being said, it can be applied to a variety of different jobs. In every job, you have to make decisions. Every business has to make decisions. And on an individual level, you have to make decisions regarding your family, your finances, etc. So although you may think of economics as falling more in the quantitative realm, it can also be applied to the qualitative realm. So not only does it pair well with majors such as finance, it also can be paired with marketing and management because you're studying consumer behavior, you're studying producer behavior as well. There's a whole field of behavioral economics that dives into why people aren't always rational and is very fascinating as far as why people make decisions the way they do. And that's pretty key when it comes to marketing and management of those people. Okay, let's keep going. Finally, we have a preview of important economic terms. We have two of them here, technology and capital. These terms aren't necessarily defined in the way you would think. Technology, in terms of economics, is defined as the processes a firm uses to produce goods and services, while capital is defined as the actual manufactured goods that are used to produce other goods and services, not capital in the traditional sense you would think of in finance. So, with that being said, if you have any questions about Chapter 1, please feel free to let me know. Thanks.